Wait, remember Spectrobes? The quote unquote Pokemon killer from Disney? Let's check in on how that's going. Well, I sure do remember it, as I was the kid that was infatuated with any piece of media that revolved around collecting monsters in some form or capacity. Obviously, there was Pokemon, but stuff like Digimon also had a huge pull for me. To an extent, Yu-Gi-Oh as well, but that's more in of the monsters in a card collecting sense, so I don't use that as the best reference here. And now there are plenty more examples, but for me, those were the biggest and most prominent franchises growing up that had me begging my parents to purchase them for me. But for my curiosity, mixed with a really good marketing campaign, Spectrobes looked to be the next big thing, and with it directly targeting the same device that Pokemon was on, it seemed like a no-brainer for me to want this. For this to be a success, and Disney to have their own little slice of the Pokemon pie. That pie flavor is money. Suffice to say that while Spectrobes had great plans and a seemingly well-executed lead-up to the game's release, the franchise ended after three games. Two for the Nintendo DS and one for the Nintendo Wii. But my time with the game when it came out has never left my memories, especially from using the input cards, utilizing the touchscreen features in a fun way, and yelling at my DS to have the Spectrobes I unlocked wake up. So I figured what better way to relive these memories and explore what this game was, what happened to it and more, than to dig right into it and unearth them. Y you see what I did there? Digging and finding things is a core mechanic of the game? <sighs> Why do I even bother? Welcome to the Spectrobes video, play the intro. It all started with an idea. Disney, while being the massive monopoly they already are, still hadn't reached the unfathomable heights they have today, now owning Marvel, Star Wars, and all of Fox. But the one department that was always hit or miss for them was their stake in the gaming space. Disney Interactive Studios, which had several name changes throughout their 28-year run before fully shutting down in 2016, focused on bringing a lot of their existing IP into the gaming space, from Toy Story to Cars, from Hannah Montana to Cory in the House. There wasn't a missed opportunity to make sure some tie-in games would always be there across most platforms. But what if there was room to innovate what Disney Interactive does in this space? What if they finally set out to make a brand new intellectual property, nothing based on existing franchises or any form of tie-in? Something solely unique. Solely unique to Disney, at least, because the only thing in terms of size that was on Disney's radar was Pokemon. Pokemon by 2007 had just finished celebrating its existence of 10 years, which seems so small in comparison to just recently celebrating 25 years. It's had worldwide success in all forms of media, from a collectible card game that still holds a stranglehold on my life today, and my wallet, a video game franchise that sells at ridiculous numbers each release, a TV series where the main character Ash Ketchum is still 10. Why is that, Sarah? Jordan, I've asked you to please stop calling me. Yeah. She's such a goofball. With Disney paying close attention to anything bringing in that kind of notoriety and moolah like Pokemon was and still is, they needed to step up their gaming department, reach into their endless pockets of cash and fund what was claimed to be the Pokemon killer. Disney then sought out Phil Barlow and Helen Mayer, a duo who have worked together on projects like Godzilla the Series, Extreme Ghostbusters, and my personal favorite holiday film of mine, Eight Crazy Nights. You're out of line, Stone. Hubba Bubba! Jennifer, she does this to me every time! And that's a technical foul! Oh, Ben, and that just gets... <laughs> That was my impression of Whitey in that movie, but now that that slice of Jordan cringe is over, these two were asked by Disney to give them that said Pokemon killer concept mixed with an anime art style. When Barlow was meeting with Chris Takami, his contact at Disney, to nail down what this concept would be, he came up with the groundwork of Spectrobes on the spot, which was agreed upon and the game would start its development to make it a reality. Now, due to its time in production and adding on that the original plans were to make this a PlayStation 3 video game, Disney wasn't as on board anymore for a couple of reasons. Those years spent without a Pokemon killer had let Pokemon become even bigger and bigger, and choosing the PS3 was an odd choice for Disney to comprehend. At first, you might say, yeah, there really isn't anything like Pokemon there, so it's an open market, right? 
Well, it's not that simple. Disney wanted to look at where the demographic is and not where it wasn't. The demographic for Pokemon is on handheld devices. At the time for the Game Boy Advance, but in 2006 for Japan and 2007 for the United States, we would see the real first major releases on the Nintendo DS with Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl. Disney thought if you want a piece of that audience, you have to go to where they are first and foremost. Interestingly though, Phil was confused as to why Disney wanted to go after the same place Pokemon was on and why Nintendo would be on board with this being on the same console in the first place, claiming that going to the PS3 would be the right way to make a game that targets Pokemon directly. This really wouldn't result in anything as Disney would have final say since they have full rights to the IP. Unfortunately, at some point, Disney decided to take the project away from Phil and Helen and put the project in the hands of the Jupiter Corporation, a studio that actually had ties to the Pokemon franchise by creating the Pokemon pinball games, as well as games like The World Ends With You, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, and much more. What they liked about Jupiter specifically was the fact that they had plenty of experience with making games for handheld consoles. The original concept art of Spectrobe shows off a very, well, different looking design in monsters and characters. Both Phil and Helen originally wanted to make the game focused on not just one protagonist, but two. It would kind of mirror their relationship having worked together since 1984, and it would give the players a choice to play as a boy or a girl character in hopes of not limiting the initial audience for the game. When the game was passed over to Jupiter, the only similarities to the original concept of Spectrobes were some character concepts and the title. Everything else that Phil and Helen worked on was essentially tossed aside. In fact, Phil and Helen were both more than willing to work alongside Jupiter in finishing what Spectrobes could be, and in fact, they were even promised directly to their face that they would be doing so. Sadly, this was nothing more than a lie to stall concerns on their part until it was too late to realize what had happened, leaving Phil and Helen in the hands of many accountants and lawyers to make sure that there was nothing more that they could do and for them to not be involved anymore, resulting in both of them no longer working in Hollywood and have since been working back in Australia for a self-created publishing studio, Zunatunes. Now that production was left in the hands of Jupiter, the game went under a complete overhaul, changing into a Nintendo DS game going after the same market share where modern Pokemon at the time was located. So now at this point, the newest Pokemon games Diamond and Pearl have officially released for the DS in Japan with the US releases coming in April of 2007. So to try and get some attention before the US release, Spectrobes would release on the DS on March 13th, 2007, beating Pokemon to the US market by a little over a month and becoming the first original IP video game from Disney. And this first Spectrobes game would go on to sell a total of 750,000 units worldwide. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl would sell nearly 18 million units. Now, this was only the game's first entry ever. To expect it to beat out Pokemon that with each generation releases a minimum of two separate versions of the game is a bit of wishful thinking. But the series wouldn't end here, and we would see more from the world of Spectrobe soon. But what is Spectrobes? Let's take a look at the game itself. The fate of the universe is in your hands. Wake up! Spectrobes. In space, our main characters Rollin and Gina are a part of the Nanario Planetary Patrol, who are sent to go and investigate something that had crashed on one of the planets in their system. Rollin is a pretty easygoing dude who is pretty blasé when it comes to the work he has to do, but despite that, always gives his best when he's going into a fight. Gina, she is less brave originally, but is helpful in many ways, dealing with technology and being supportive with her knowledge, but less helpful when remembering to file mission reports back to the commander. You had one job, Gina. You assume the role of Rollin while Gina ends up as an NPC who stays aboard your ship. Upon your arrival on the planet Daichi, you enter a rainy and presumed desolate land with nothing really in sight. That is, until you find a prismod next to a crashed capsule that looks to have an old man stuck on the inside. Before thinking any further, a black and purple tornado comes out of nowhere and attacks Rollin, leaving him in a battle instantly with two weird creatures by his side, as he has to defeat three of the same type of enemies in the game, the Crawl. Once you take them out, you realize that one, you yourself didn't deal too much damage to these creatures at all, and two, that some weird creatures came out of the prismod you added to your device on your arm to aid you in the battle. 
where they were able to deliver substantially more damage to the crawl. Moving forward, they bring the capsule on board and while investigating it, the man inside wakes up as we call him Mr. X. No, not the Resident Evil variety of Mr. X, thankfully. When speaking to you, he realizes that too much time had passed from his travels and he's worried that it may be too late for his home planet and the people that live there. Because the crawl had taken over and are described as amoebic-like planet-eating fiends. His goal was to find a way to stop the crawl from expanding throughout space and wiping out every planet full of their inhabitants. He mentions that the spectrobes could be the answer in stopping the crawl. Gina responds, giving us a bit of context as to what the spectrobes are. Extinct creatures from ancient times that are nothing but fossils right now. I guess Gina just didn't see the fight outside with the tornado when the spectrobes that came out of my wrist, but okay. The fossil part though does excite Mr. X as he had hoped that there were fossils still around here for said spectrobes, as well as minerals. I'm really refraining from making some sort of Breaking Bad joke or reference here, so you're welcome for me sparing you from that. But regardless, Mr. X's mission doesn't seem to have failed, as this was the star system he was looking for as it is the origin star system of the Spectrobes. Rollin explains to Mr. X that he had an encounter with the crawl and some creatures came out of the device, which shocks him as he was able to use the Prismon, alluding to Mr. X not having such luck. And now with the crawl in this star system, Mr. X warns them that they need to prepare for battle by finding and awakening the Spectrobes in order to stop this impending threat. To back up what he is telling Telling them, he hands Rollin a Comapod fossil, and is told that he needs to awaken it so he can have a grander picture of what needs to be done to save the star system, and the rest of space in general, from the crawl. Using the lab system aboard the ship, you have to yell at the right levels you're indicated to into the DS's mic to wake up the spectrobes from their fossil state. Rollin is shown to be the only one out of the group that can actually communicate properly with the spectrobes to bring them back to life, and have the ability to use the Prismod when you first awaken a spectrobe in baby form form before it's all leveled up, it's not used for battle, but rather a partner to follow you around outside of battle to help locate minerals, cubes, and fossils underground for you to dig up, being one of the game's main mechanics. From here, you're set upon the land to look for these items and spectrobes while you deal with ongoing attacks from the crawl. When your commander calls you in after the mission, you are told that there have been reports throughout the star system of those vortexes running amok, and he needs you to focus on continuing what Mr. X explained for you to do. Sorry, Aldous, that's what we find out his name is. But before you can go back out in the field, the commander knows the dangerous stakes out there, and how Rollin himself can't really fight back against the crawl like the Spectrobes can. So he sends them out to the security center where Rollin is given his iconic sword and blaster. Now your journey to investigate and stop the crawl by finding and awakening Spectrobes to fight back against them has begun. The game's main functions can be split into three main categories outside of the storytelling and dialogue, with exploring the land and excavating out various items and fossils, awakening the spectrobes and having the ability to level them up and swap them around, and of course, the battle system. In between the story and exploration, the battling is what you'll mainly be doing throughout the game time. Like I mentioned, the damage you deal as Rollin isn't too great. Even when you get the sword and blaster and level them up or swap things around, it never really makes that much of a difference what you are using or how you're using them, leaving you as just a character that runs around the battle arena as a way to move the spectrobes you have out and around you. So in that case, why not also still attack with Rollin since you gotta move around towards the crawl anyway? It's not gonna do a lot of damage, but what else are you gonna do? You'll mainly rely on the spectrobes you choose for the battle and level up throughout the game to take down the crawl which when it comes to using them can easily be a big difference with how quick the battles go. And for the most part, they never really feel too quick, which sadly hinders part of the enjoyment of the game. The battles don't have this callback feeling that make you want to go and enter the battles and reap the rewards. Instead, trying to avoid the battles seems more fun in your efforts of mining for goods across the different planets. Or just to get to the next part in the story, Spectrobes in battle can have a nice mix of abilities from being able to have close up or further ranging attack moves. Some giving you options of multiple and more intricate moves making leveling up, swapping them in and out, and carefully crafting your team a nice 
nice bonus for any time the battling feels a bit too stale. As for the rewards from the battles, you never really feel all that rewarded enough per battle, being rewarded with very small amounts of Minergy, which is the main thing that you want as they are essentially the experience points used in leveling up the Spectrobes. But then we have typings, which here are called properties, and when you think about Pokemon, this makes you go, oh, no, th this should be interesting, and really skill-based, depending on how you build your team and plan strategies. But this isn't Pokemon, and there's only three typings that your Spectrobes and the Crawl will be. The third game throws them all out the window for a new five that seem a bit easier to understand what they are. Aside from that, when it comes to the Crawl themselves in battle, the fight they put up isn't much as the AI isn't too intensive, making these slower battles feel even more like a time waster than an engaging mechanic that drives you to keep battling. And to utilize the DS's touchscreen capabilities in-game, the mining features are way more fun and net you a better return for your time and for what you can unlock. You're able to get more tools in order to help you carefully excavate everything out by making sure you're careful as to not damage the items, in turn making it a bit more fun to play. And it's also kind of therapeutic in a way. I honestly would play a game that only has you creatively do this for hours and I'd be a happy little fringe. With these two main elements combined, the battling and mining, the game's pacing balance does come into question here as to if I feel like I'm having fun playing through it. I like the story, I like digging things out of the ground, I like collecting the spectrobes, but the battle mechanics feel severely lacking and presentation-wise, extremely underwhelming. And it feels weird to say that I genuinely enjoy so much of this game and the game series in general because of the parts that I mentioned I like, but at least with this first game, it hurts those nicer sentiments because it's such a big chunk of what the game is. I'm not playing for the battles, I'm playing for the lore, not the boar. But for the Pokemon-esque aspect of the game in collecting and leveling up these Spectrobes to fully see their forms, it's really cool. Some of the coolest designs out there that look and feel powerful, most times giving me a Digimon-inspired look more so than anything. But what makes them all feel special is that they all are heavily themed after their ancient lore, looking as if they come from a long time ago, resembling these great mythical protectors in the style of statues or carvings. There's so much to like here, but unfortunately, it's constantly battling its simplistic and lackluster battling system. While it's not bad for the sake of being unplayable, it just feels unenjoyable. Getting through Spectrobes, it still felt worth it, however. The story isn't too in-depth, but it has enough lore and cool sci-fi elements to keep your attention. And once again, the Spectrobes themselves make you want to play, so you can find them all, see what they become, but not so much to use them for battle. But what's a Pokemon killer without adding on a secondary function that works both as an interesting gimmick and a way to emulate Pokemon cards, but like on a much smaller level? With each copy of the game, you would get a pack of four input cards and you would be encouraged to collect them and trade them. But what makes them more unique than just having a collecting and trading tagline to them was the fact that you can lay them over top the touchscreen of the DS and tap the open slots in the right order to unlock spectrobes, minerals, and custom parts in game. For the third entry of the series on the Wii, the approach went to entering a code from the cards and connecting the dots in the right order resembling constellations. But before you say that's some sort of locking content behind a paywall, it was possible to unlock everything from the cards without even using them if you can find the right patterns. And the fans of the game online posted guides, templates, and information on how to do so. So technically, you can unlock all those goods within the game without needing those cards. As far as the rest of the Spectrobes franchise, it does a major upswing in so many departments, but would that be enough to continue Continue the franchise along after a rocky start. Battle your Spectrobes beyond the portals. Spectrobes beyond the portals. From the jump, Spectrobes had a rocky pre-production, especially in the way Disney parted with Phil and Helen. Disney wanted a Pokemon killer, and they went directly after the same space Pokemon occupies to directly compete. After the release of the first game dealing with under a million in sales and middling reviews, it overall wasn't the Pokemon killer they had hoped for, but that doesn't mean it was a one and done deal. They wanted to make this a franchise with longevity and keep it going, so their first thought was to make sure there would be a new entry every year. 
Aside from the complete collector's edition version that came with all the input cards, in October of 2008, we would see the game's first sequel release, Spectrobes Beyond the Portals. While feeling pretty much like the previous game, we do get some changes to the initial gameplay, specifically the battling system where instead of playing as Rollin and the two Spectrobes at once, you take control of either of the two Spectrobes as the other gets controlled by the computer, allowing you to focus in battle on one specific thing at a time rather than doing everything Thing at once. Along with that, the story takes on a more elaborate plot with these portals showing up that are releasing Crawl into the Nanario star system thanks to these four higher Crawl beings taking out the towers that block these type of oncoming attacks. Reviews here ended up being slightly higher than the first game, so an overall improvement in the eyes of the fan base. We also get to meet Crux, the main antagonist of the Spectrobes games who we later find out in the third game has a history as a Spectro master at one point in time. Aside from his want of control and killing off planets while they're in inhabitants, he's able to control a fusion of spectrobes and crawl that he calls true dark spectrobes. He has deep ties to the overall story across the spectrobes games, minus making any appearance in the first games with his origins pre-spectrobes being dived into in the third game. And speaking of the third game, spectrobes origins, it would take the biggest leap, moving from the limitations of the DS and moving to Nintendo's flagship console at the time, the Nintendo Wii, now being developed by Genki instead of Jupiter and released releasing in August of 2009. The first major thing that you'll notice is the obvious graphical upgrade. Of course, moving to a console from a handheld will turn anything into a better looking product, but wow, this game genuinely looks gorgeous in comparison to the DS games. Another thing you'll notice is that Gina is finally a playable character, hearkening back to the original vision the game had under Phil and Helen's original concept, so if anything, that was really cool to see. The game expands greatly upon the concept of Spectrobes, taking the exploration to a third-person perspective rather than a semi-top-down look. You're essentially doing the same thing as the DS games, but everything feels so much more refined here. A nice touch to the battles is that there isn't a vortex that brings you into the battle arena of sorts, but rather occur naturally within the worlds you visit, giving a more open feeling with less restraints. It looks and feels more engaging than ever. Now, when it comes to waking up the Spectrobes you dig out of the ground, you don't need that little Nintendo Wii microphone add-on you bought for Animal Crossing City Folk. Instead, you use the Wiimote Nunchuck in a specific order of movement. It received fairly decent reviews, but sold the worst in the series at this point. The story in this game has our characters falling through one of the portals that brings them into the Kaio system. A place where, thanks to a major war with the Crawl, the original Spectro masters with numbers in the thousands were all killed off. Now dealing with Crawl in this star system, Gina and Rollin are on a mission to find the five shards of the king containing the fossil of a legendary beast king. And as Crux is still pulling the strings from a Crawl sphere, a several thousand mile wide massive Crawl, Rollin and Gina are able to put together the five pieces bringing forth the ultimate form Spectrobe Kaio to take out the Crawl for good until you see the post credit scene teasing something that was never fulfilled. Also, the game had voice acting, which was a huge plus in bringing our main duo to life. And here's a weird yet fun connection. Since I've been covering the series of Ben 10 on my cartoon channel, this stuck out like a sore thumb, so hear me out, this is pretty fun. When Ben becomes older in the franchise in Alien Force, the voice actor for Ben changed to Yuri Lowenthal. Yuri also happens to voice Rollin in Spectrobe's Origins. But the Ben 10 connection doesn't stop there. Thomas Perkins, a character designer on Ben 10, was directly trained by the original concept designer for Spectrobes, Phil Barlow, when they were working together on Extreme Ghostbusters. I just find that so interesting and I hope you did as well. Such a weird little connection between the franchises that impact neither of them. Anyway, the games put up as much of a fight as they could within the space that they went after. I mean, the ads and the trailers alone garnered quite the attention, but here's the thing. To be a Pokemon killer, you need to be on a Pokemon production level. Level. Like I mentioned earlier, Pokemon isn't just the games, it's the trading cards, the anime, the toys, the books, etc. Spectrobes just didn't have that, but that's not to say it didn't at least try to extend off of the games somewhat. And while the input cards were cool and actually served a function for the games themselves, they were never really meant to rival any sort of trading card product like Pokemon had. Other media for Spectrobes would consist of stuff like a series of three books written by Ned Lur, which were set to tell more stories outside of the games with these characters, with the third being more closely related to the games itself. A fourth 
book was produced but never fully publicized, most likely due to sales of the first three. If words aren't your thing and you need some nice pictures to go along with them just like me, then there was a short-lived three-part manga that ran in, Shogaku Yonensei, an educational magazine that was more so targeted at a younger demographic in Japan. Or if you really just don't want any words at all, check out 3D Media Toon's comic panels of the opening scenes from the game, complete in color without any silly little text to ruin your day. But what if I told you there was a fourth Spectrobes game? No, for real, y'all have cell phones, right? That's right, a mobile-only Spectrobes game was released that has you fight space pirates over missing Spectrobes after Holland recovers his Prismod back from them stealing it. As of 2015, however, the game was taken off the Apple App Store and no longer available for download. But the real question is, what about some sort of cartoon or anime? I mean, these protagonists are practically begging for it. Well, there were a bunch of webisodes released in promotion for the games. The first game alone had 10, which all focused somewhat on the plot of the first game, with the last four made for Beyond the Portals, but what about Spectrobe's Origins? Well, instead of continuing with more webisodes, they instead just re-released all the previous episodes in order to promote the game, which is kind of a bummer to see, but seeing how this was their last attempt at the Spectrobe franchise, I'm not really surprised. All in all, Spectrobes was an idea that had great ambition, but maybe not the best intentions initially from Disney. The original concept of the game series felt like there was some thought out and thoughtful planning to make everything feel a bit more special. But when you set out directly to take on another major entity and remove the thing that would make it special, the soul of it, you lose sight of the bigger picture and you no longer have that longevity. While I grew up with these games and have enjoyed my time with them, there just isn't a lot that brings me back to them. Sure, the designs of the creatures can range from cute to really cool, offering some nice Digimon-esque vibes mixed with an ancient aesthetic. It's just not enough when the games don't offer enough in its other departments. Whether it's the gameplay, or the not as easy to navigate menus, or just overall a pretty simplified story, the sci-fi action RPG series never fully got to hit its tried after three games on two different platforms. I do think there is potential here to revisit and revitalize the franchise for the modern day, but it would really be up to Disney if they'd want to risk the investment after the entirety of the Spectrobes games sold a total of 1.6 million copies, with each iteration selling less and less upon release. But what about you? What are your thoughts on the Spectrobes franchise? Do you think it has the potential to come back one day? What are some memories you have with the games if you have some? Let me know all of that in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe with notifications on for more content like this. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.